This is Southern Cross News with Joe Palmer. Good evening, everyone. A Railton family is in despair tonight after their elderly grandmother died while trapped inside her burning home. The shocked relatives raised the alarm after coming across the house fully alight. An isolated property just outside Railton is the scene of the tragedy. Just after 8 o'clock last night, family members went to check on the elderly lady who lived alone. Upon arrival, they found the weatherboard home engulfed in flames. The occupant was still inside. The house is completely gutted. Um, yeah, so they certainly couldn't save it. Detectives and forensics are examining the charred remains of the home. However, the incident is not being treated as suspicious. Early indications suggest it could have been caused by a wood fire or an electrical fault. Obviously winter is always a time when there's wood heaters being used, heaters and that sort of thing, so we just urge anyone to take care around those types of items. Police have told us relatives of the deceased are severely traumatised by the tragedy. A report is now being prepared for the coroner. Authorities say they are keeping in contact with the family through this difficult time. Tom Johnson, Southern Cross News. Meanwhile, fire investigators have returned to the scene of a house fire near Campbelltown. The 1860s home on the property known as Viewpoint along Isis Road went up in flames yesterday. It took two and a half hours to control the blaze. Following further investigation overnight and this morning, the estimated damage cost has been increased to $1 million. The blaze is still believed to have been caused by a chimney fire. Fresh allegations have been made against former TASTAFE CEO Stephen Conway on the final day of budget estimates. The Education Minister has been pressed on claims that wooden boats owned by Mr Conway were being serviced by TAFE students and staff. It's been less than a month since former TAS TAFE CEO Stephen Conway was found by the Integrity Commission of misusing funds. Budget estimates today bringing forward fresh allegations. There have been up to three wooden boats and at least one there currently owned by Mr Stephen Conway being stored at the Campbell Street campus and that can you confirm that staff and students were required to work on these wooden boats owned by Mr Conway. I know in one of the correspondents uh, a boat was mentioned, I can't confirm the number. A similar claim made on the storage of a child's pedal car at the Devonport campus, also allegedly owned by Mr Conway. We are having an independent uh, special investigation and audit uh, into uh, TAS TAFE. The fact that the Minister didn't know whether or not TAFE had been contracted to do the work or there'd been any kind of procurement uh, and simply said these are issues that we'll look at in an audit is not good enough. The Minister using estimates to hit back at claims of lost money under Gongski 2, preempting an even bigger loss under the opposition. Why are you still the only Minister who's actually welcomed the commitment? I don't want this state, uh, by not agreeing with Gongski 2, to lose $300 million. $300 million, Chair. And as the minister fought inside, the Australian Education Union rallied outside ahead of tomorrow's Council of Australian Governments meeting with the Prime Minister in Hobart. This is scaremongering from the Coalition Government and it's scaremongering from the Tasmanian Government. We expect them to stand up strongly and back the kids and our schools, just as Premiers right around the country will be doing at COAG tomorrow. Jacqueline Robson, Southern Cross News. An international energy developer has signed on to a billion dollar wind farm proposal for Tasmania's northwest. UPC Renewables will partner with the Hammond family who owns Robins Island and other areas around Smithton. It's anticipated the project would generate up to 1,000 megawatts of energy and would be ready for investment by 2019. The company is relying on a second Basslink interconnector, tipped to be one of the largest wind farms in the southern hemisphere. It comes just two days after a wind farm announcement for the Central Highlands, with the third wind farm proposal expected for Granville Harbour soon. The state government has been accused of politicking on the issue of salmon farming on the East Coast. Today's announcement of a fish farming ban for the Mercury Passage near Triabunna has been described as a farce by environmentalists. It will still allow Tazsal to expand into the pre-existing Oakhampton Bay lease. 
They've broken numerous laws in Macquarie Harbour and Premier Hodgman has done nothing. In fact, he's signed off on changes the, to the law to protect Tassel and Macquarie Harbour. So no, a Facebook video does not make me feel OK, does not make me think that Tassel should be allowed to trash O'Campton Bay. 99% of the Greater Mercury Passage, uh, salmon farming will be banned from that area. Uh, that gives certainty and clarity uh, to all uh, concerned uh, Tasmanians. The ban does not apply to approved land-based infrastructure. A man who's been living with cancer for the past two decades has told how clinical research trials have helped keep him alive. The Cancer Council has provided two Tasmanian hospitals over a million dollars for cancer research over the last 20 years, with the money playing a critical role in treatment breakthroughs. Greg Sproul has been living with cancer for 22 years. During that time, he's undergone six clinical treatment trials. It's never cured the disease, but it has sort of kept it controlled to a certain extent, which has been uh, excellent as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Every three weeks, he receives an hour of immune-boosting therapy. Here's a trial, and uh, that's the idea for the trial, I guess, to see if it will work. This one doesn't have anywhere near as many side effects. Uh, you still get uh, lethargic, tired and nauseous, but nowhere near like chemotherapy. His cancer isn't curable, but he says the treatment he's receiving today is keeping him alive. And the alternative is not very nice. <laughs> there are currently 50 clinical trials to treat solid tumours or haematological and blood cancers that are open to Tasmanian patients. In some way we collect registry data so that we can look at improving our outcomes by looking at what's happening to patients who are having treatment now. For 20 years, Cancer Council Tasmania has helped fund cancer research and clinical trials. Over that time, $1 million has been provided to the Royal Hobart Hospital and the Launceston General Hospital. The more money that we can put into mission, of course, the more lives that we can save. And we're certainly very proud of the fact that the clinical trials work is saving lives. And it's not just Tasmanian lives, it's Australian and international lives. Louise Hedger, Southern Cross News. A former Tasmanian senator has again been released on bail, despite not entering pleas to trafficking abalone charges. Shane Michael Murphy appeared in the Launceston Magistrates Court for the third time this morning. He's been charged with unlawfully possessing more than 20 abalone and trafficking in fish. His wife, Katie Liu, has been charged with similar offences, but didn't appear today as she's in China. Both Mr Murphy and Ms Liu will be directed to enter pleas next time they face the magistrate on July 25. The night before Dark Mofo kicks off and final preparations are nearly all complete. Organisers say they're ready for the thousands of visitors to flock through their gates and there's certainly something for everyone. The bars and food stalls are nearly all bumped in and the lights and speakers around Hobart have been tested for the final preparations for Dark Mofo. Organisers say they're gearing up for a bumper festival. So I hope the entire experience is a surprise and that they discover things that uh, they don't know is in the program and that they just come and wander around the city, explore and uh, see where the ride takes them. It's described as a large-scale public playground. Dark Park has been designed to be family friendly with art installations for the children and interactive installations to entertain the adults after dark. We've got um, a number of artworks, storytelling, there's a work by Terrapin Puppet Theatre, um, the Ogger Ogger is, is located in the good shed, so yeah, lots of things for families. Down the road, the Winter Feast takes pride of place at Princess Wharf, running across seven days and over two weekends. It's a pretty electric atmosphere, it's really exciting, there's um, a lot of food cooked on fire, that's a really strong theme, and there's a lot of um, handmade kind of really interesting barbecues and really well crafted, especially from the heavy metal kitchen, you know, amazing cooking equipment. Gastronomical delights will be available to punters, with local chefs serving up some of their Tasmanian specials with an international twist. Yeah. We're doing a Thai style sausage, a Chiang Mai style sausage. We're going to be doing a musaman, which is like a beef curry, so using beef from our farm and turnips from our farm, um, but with some Thai flavours. Ticket sales have increased by 110% since last year, with events held over 27 venues. It's quite staggering. I think we've, uh, we're reaching two, mi two million now, 
Uh, we've got over a thousand staff, 666 artists. The bulk of the festival kicks off from tomorrow afternoon. Louise Hedger, Southern Cross News. And joining us now from Salamanca Place is reporter Louise Hedger. Good evening, Louise. Things are looking fantastic. It's an exciting atmosphere down here tonight, Joe. The staff are buzzing about, checking that the lights are all working and that the fire pits are set up for the first day tomorrow. I'm here with the Winterfeast project manager, Joe Pickett. Joe, how are you feeling the day before thousands plod through the gate? Very excited. Yeah, we can't wait for tomorrow. We've got a, a big team of people who've been working very hard all day today and all week to prepare for a really good winter feast. And in true Mona fashion, they're keeping some surprises up their sleeves. I'll be down here tomorrow night to give you more. Joe. Lovely. Thanks so much for that, Louise. Louise Hedger joining us from Salamanca. With young men overrepresented in official statistics, Lifeline Tasmania has launched its latest campaign to curb the rate of suicide in the state. The three-step plan aims to remove the stigma and help people support a friend or loved one when times get tough. It's a blunt and difficult question, but it may save a life. Ask directly. Are you thinking about suicide? This new series of online ads is aimed at young people, with many too afraid to mention the S word. Lifeline says it's OK. 76% of suicides in Australia are men, with 18 to 30 year olds accounting for a disproportionate number of deaths in official records. What we're looking at is a, a really big opportunity to c connect with more males so that we can walk through the process, so that we can talk to them, we can ask, we can listen and, um, and we can get help for them. National Lifeline CEO Pete Schmeagel's son Tim attempted suicide three times as a teenager. He made it through after seeking professional help and is now a healthy 24-year-old trekking thousands of kilometres across Australia and beyond raising money for the cause. He uh, believes in being uh, an example to other young people that, yeah, we go through our dark times. Sometimes we can't figure out the world, but if we stick with it, if we basically connect to others, if we reach out, if we basically communicate about our issues, things do get better. Lifeline is already planning to expand the program to target different demographics. And for those who may not have someone close to talk to in person, there's always someone ready to listen. In fact, Lifeline does it around 18,000 times a year. Just make the call and let us work with you. Um, it is not judgmental. Um, we are trained for an incredible number of hours in a lot of skills to help you unload and to find a way to get it out. Lifeline can be contacted on 13 11 14. If someone's life is in immediate danger, call triple zero. Andrew McCarthy, Southern Cross News. A 16-year-old Tasmanian boy has been given an opportunity of a lifetime, the chance to ride freestyle motocross in China. Jaden Bailey is set to leave the state on Sunday to join the factory FMX team near Hong Kong. He's riding high and he has good reason. No! Jaden Bailey has been riding motorbikes since he was two. Then, three years ago, with the help of a neighbour, decided to give freestyle a go. Joey Walters, uh, you know, inspired me. I used to go over to his track just down the road and he would always be riding and I just wanted to be like him. Jaden's practice and persistence are paying off. He's now packing his bags, ready to move to China for six months. There, the teen will join an Australian group called Factory FMX. He will perform as part of a car stunt show each night. But Jaden admits it was by chance he got the gig. Josh Burden actually messaged me uh, quite a few months ago and asked me if I knew anyone that backflipped and I said no. I wanted to backflip before I was 16 and it was coming up to, up to my birthday so I ended up flipping and then he hit me up again and said now you're backflipping, do you want to come to China? Jaden's parents proud of what their son has achieved. It was a great opportunity. Yes, hopefully he'll go a long way with it. But they do admit watching him freestyle isn't always the best experience. Sometimes I can't watch him. It scares me that much. It was scary to start with, but, you know, I do it most weekends and I'm pretty used to it. I'd crash a trick, I'd know not to do that again. Jaden says his big dream is to one day join Nitro Circus. But for now, the sky's the limit. Monika Dadson at Southern Cross News.
The fight to save the Tasmanian devil has gone high tech. A $20,000 donation helping to buy virtual fencing to keep animals off our roads. The boost coming just weeks after 33 more devils were released into the wild. They might look small, but these devices are helping save our Tassie Devil. The mouse size units create a virtual fence, and when they are hit by car headlights, they emit a light and an audible sound to deter animals from roads. And the sound's kind of an irritating zip, 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 quite loud and that's what alerts the animals to oncoming traffic. The device is already being used across the state. The Arthur River Highway trial that we ran showed them to reduce roadkill by as much as 60-70%. But the release of 33 devils into the Wakalina Mount William area in the northeast last month meant more virtual fencing was needed. $10,000 donations from both the Wildcare Sapphire Devil Fund and the Woolnorth Wind Farm helping make that a reality. When you think about the amount of time, effort, energy and so forth into getting these devils inoculated and releasing them, we don't want to then see them run over by a car the next day. So far, all the devils in the latest release are still alive, but many in previous releases weren't so lucky. The Save the Tasmanian Devil program says it's important devils are released back into the wild to support the ecosystem. It would also like to see more virtual fencing across the state. In an ideal world, they'd be in all the national parks where there are cars. Monika Dadson at Southern Cross News. Stroke, diabetes and asthma are leading causes of illness in Tasmania. To help prevent their prevalence, a pharmacy in Bridgewater today offered free health checks to local residents. The aim of it is just to improve the health of our um, clientele. Um, we're a very tight community out here, um, so we're just looking at ways to broaden our influence on the community. Staff say preventative checks and advice help people sustain a healthy life and that many issues relate to a lack of understanding over taking the right medication. Now let's take a look at the day's business and finance news with thanks to Tasplan, your local super fund. The share market has closed slightly higher as rallies in bank and healthcare stocks outweighed falls among energy, mining and industrial stocks. The ASX 200 index has risen by 9.4 points. A short time ago, the Australian dollar was trading at 75.5 US cents and 104.75 New Zealand cents. In local football, Tasmanian coach Anthony Taylor has finalised his squad for Saturday's representative game against the might of the Neafal at Blunston Arena. Rhys Mott retains his place after getting a late call-up yesterday, while Alex Lee is listed as an emergency. Also missing out on the big match, Lauderdale Bombers pair Bryce Walsh and Nat Franklin. Meanwhile, the Neafal will boast eight former AFL-listed players, including former Sydney Swans forward Xavier Rich. Richards. Richie Port has stamped his authority on the Criterium de Dorpene, setting the fastest time in last night's individual time trial. The 12 second win catapulting Port up the leaderboard from 30th overall to second, heading into stage five. Pundits are expecting a quieter race from Port tonight before the battle for first in the general classification takes to the mountains in the final three stages. I'm just so happy where I'm at at the moment, I'm so close to the tour and I really hope this year with a little bit of luck that it can be um, a, a good Tour de France for me. Tour de France kicks off on July 1. Well, he's only 18 years of age, but an eagle-eyed Tasmanian is preparing to take on the globe at the upcoming Archery World Cup. Matthew Everett spends hours each day honing his skills under the guidance of a former world champion. This young Tasmanian is archery's exciting new prospect. Matthew Everett first picked up a bow and arrow four years ago. Now he practices up to 40 hours per week and is sweeping competitions nationwide. He's steady as a rock. And the next target is his biggest yet, the Archery World Cup in Salt Lake City, Utah. First international tournament, so I just want the experience leading up to a couple more international tournaments next year. Everett was previously aiming to make the junior titles, but after scoring so well in qualifying, he's been promoted to the Opens. I just started to put more hours in, started shooting more and helping more people with it, and it just 
grew the passion and the love for the sport. Everett says 90% of archery is played in the head. The sharpshooter admits he will need to calm his nerves on the big stage. A lot of people overthink it and they, they stay at full draw for too long and their shot starts to break down. It's all, yeah, it's just let down, reset and just take a breath. There is a steady hand on his shoulder. Former world champion and fellow club member Clint Freeman is Everett's personal coach. The club is wrapped with its new prodigy. He's always working on some aspect of his technique, his form, equipment, you know, and he's, he's hungry to know everything. The bullseyes begin in Utah on June 20. Tom Johnson, Southern Cross News. Good evening, Hobart reached 13. Today, Launceston, Burnie and Devonport all on 14 degrees. Temperatures range from minus 4 at Ooze to our high of 15 at St Helens, Friendly Beaches, Bridport and Flinders Island. A weak front did cross today, bringing a shower to the west and Bass Strait. King Island, the highest fall with 10 mils. Wynyard and Campania, 14 degrees. Groves, Strawn and King Island, 13. Bushy Park, 12. Lyaweenie, 7. Now, the frontal cloud band did cross Tasmania. There is low-level cloud over the bite and the system that brought all the Heavy rain to Sydney is quite evident there off the New South Wales coast. The rest of the country mostly cloud free. Extensive low level cloud over most of the state today except the east where some high cloud drifted across. Tomorrow the large high over the bite extends all the way to New Zealand eh? and covers most of Australia. A trough is off the far north coast of New South Wales. Winds west to south westerly at 10 to 15 knots increasing to 20 to 30 knots over the south. Swells at 4 metres in western and southern waters. Strong wind warning, that's for waters between Tasman Island and low rocky point. Partly cloudy for Friday in Hobart, 14 the top, one overnight for Hewenville, bit of fog to start the day and 14 the maximum, 14 the top also for Campania. Launceston, morning fog, 15 later, 14 degrees for Devonport, morning fog for Georgetown, a top of 14. Burnie tomorrow, partly cloudy and 15 degrees, a shower for Strawn, 13 the top and 15 for Wynyard. For St Helens, partly cloudy and 15, warming right up to 16 at Swansea, Port Arthur, a top of 14 degrees. Now to kick off the long weekend, fine after a cold start along with a frost, just a shower or two over western parts on Saturday. A few showers for the west extending to the northwest on Sunday, but mainly fine across the rest of the state. Partly cloudy over the north and east on Monday, maybe another shower over the west and far south. 24 again in Perth on a sunny day, partly cloudy weather for Adelaide and Brisbane. A morning shower forecast for Melbourne, showers again for Sydney and the dry season doing its thing over Darwin. It's partly cloudy here, 10 degrees in Hobart, 6 degrees in Launceston and 10 degrees right now in Devonport. Joe, back tomorrow night with the long weekend weather forecast. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Murph. Well, that's all from the news team for now. Enjoy the football and I'll see you a bit later with updates. Bye-bye.